The day has finally come. We've seen for the first time characters from Amazon's upcoming Lord of the Rings adaptation in images that display more than just their hands. We also got the most insight into the show, the timeline, the story, and the people behind it than ever before. Some came as a great comfort to me. Some have me very intrigued. And in all honesty, some make me kind of nervous. If it's your first time here, hit that subscribe button for not only the latest on the Rings of Power, but also weekly lore videos diving further into Tolkien's world. First, I'll note one of the most comforting bits of news. We are not getting a Game of Thrones-esque version of Middle-earth. In the Vanity Fair interview with showrunners Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne, McKay is quoted saying the goal was to make a show for everyone, for kids who are 11, 12, and 13 even though sometimes they might have to pull the blanket up over their eyes if it's a little too scary. This should come as great news for all who are concerned about it being compared to Game of Thrones and were duped by bogus rumors that circulated around the production. As many of us believed, it appears that when Bezos said he wanted the next Game of Thrones, he indeed meant he wanted the next cultural phenomenon that everyone was talking about. And as I've often said, with a broader audience to appeal to, Lord of the Rings has the potential to be even bigger. The fact that the showrunners seem to understand this element of Tolkien is a huge comfort. We also got confirmation of what I've long expected, that this will be a condensed timeline of the Second Age. With the creation of the Rings of Power and the Fall of Numenor storyline happening over 1700 years apart in the books, it makes sense to condense this storyline in order to tell these stories simultaneously, or rather to have one lead into the other. I must, however, lament the loss of a longer timeline here. While the article points out that mortal characters would be dying off each season, that is a very important aspect of Tolkien's world. The fact that elves linger and men pass by them in what seems like the blink of an eye. I hope there isn't too much condensing as it could really come at the detriment of elven characters like Elrond, Gil-galad, and Galadriel. Not to mention mortal Numenorean king ar Farazon whose aging and fear of death is a major reason Sauron is able to corrupt him. Among the other first looks, we get portraits of two dwarves, and confirmation that we'll see Khazad Dûm in all its Second Age glory. This was something that was very high on my wish list for the series, as the descriptions of Moria in the books are amazing, and its size and scope are truly breathtaking. The way Gimli describes it makes me love it all the more. The two dwarves we see here are Owain Arthur as Durin IV, prince of the bustling subterranean realm of Khazad Dûm, and the dwarven princess Disa, played by Sophia Nonvete, standing at Khazad Dûm's entrance. Now we've got to address the elephant in the room with these characters. Durin IV wasn't a prince of Khazad Dûm during the creation of the Rings of Power. It was Durin III. Now maybe Vanity Fair just used the wrong Roman numeral but the number of Durins seems like kind of a silly thing to change. I may be going down way too far of a hypothetical rabbit hole here, but I hope they don't make it seem that Durin is just another name to the dwarves. Like if Durin III is this guy's dad, that will be a seemingly minor thing that would be a major omission of the dwarven culture. The dwarves of Khazad Dûm believe Durin I, who was the original father of their people, is reincarnated every so often. So when one gets the name Durin, it is because they are so alike to him in appearance and manner that he is believed to be Durin reincarnated. So there simply can't be multiple Durins at the same time. Like I said, it's a hypothetical rabbit hole. Next up, we have two more characters created for the series. Sylvan elf Arondir, played by Ishmael Cruz Cordova, and Bronwyn, played by Nazanin Boniadi. We are told that this image of Bronwyn is in her apothecary in Middle-earth's Southlands. And in this image, we are told the two share a forbidden love and are in the village of Tirharad, another name that is original to the series. This will be our first depiction of a male elf and female mannish character in the immortal slash mortal love dynamic. For those unfamiliar, this dynamic is not unique to this adaptation. In the Silmarillion during the First Age, Galadriel's brother, Agnor, loved the mortal woman, Andreth. It results in one of the most beautiful and sorrowful conversations between Andreth and Agnor and Galadriel's brother, Finrod, and is certainly worth checking out if you're not familiar with it. 
I can't help but wonder if we'll see some inspiration from this story in the depiction of the pairing of Bronwyn and Arandir. I'm very curious to see how this plays out. Tolkien tells us of exactly three elf-man pairings, the other two being Baron and Luthien and Aragorn and Arwen. These are incredibly rare and typically come at a huge cost. Now we've seen what a misguided attempt at this storyline looks like, and it's not pretty. Why does it hurt so much? Personally, I hope this pairing has a tragic end like that of Agnor and Andreth, not out of spite for created characters by any means, but because what makes the pairings of Beren and Luthien and Aragorn and Arwen so significant is because of their rarity. Even Beren and Luthien die before living their happy second lives together. Front and center in this article is Galadriel. The article's opening paragraph launches us into this new era of Middle-earth adaptations. Galadriel's world is a raging sea, far from the wise, ethereal elven queen that Kate Blanchett brought to Peter Jackson's acclaimed films. The Galadriel played by Morvid Clark in Amazon's upcoming series The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, is thousands of years younger, as angry and brash as she is clever, and certain that evil is looming closer than anyone realizes. By episode two, her warnings set her adrift, literally and figuratively, until she's struggling for survival on a raft in the storm-swept, sundering seas, alongside a mortal castaway named Halbrand, who is a new character introduced in the show. Galadriel is fighting for the future. Halbrand is running from the past. Their entwined destinies are just two of the stories woven together for a TV series that, if it works, could become a global phenomenon. If it falls short, it could become a cautionary tale for anyone who, to quote J.R.R. Tolkien, delves too greedily and too deep. We get four images featuring Galadriel in this piece, more than any other character. First, we have a simple image of her head above water, a behind-the-scenes look at her and the aforementioned Halbrand. There's a shot of her in full armor, where she is described as commander of the Northern Armies, and one with Elrond, as they are reuniting in Linden. This is our first look at Gil-galad's elven kingdom that lies on the west coast of Middle-earth, and incidentally encompasses the Grey Havens that we saw in The Return of the King. As two of my all-time favorite Tolkien characters, Seeing Elrond and Galadriel together in an elvish realm is an absolute gem of an image for me. I can't tell you how excited I am to see these two characters throughout the Second Age. I've said for quite some time that I think Elrond is one of the most compelling characters in all of Tolkien's works, for those willing to dive into his life story. Galadriel is likewise one of the great Tolkien characters, and certainly one that is well deserving of a beefed up role in a show that will require a lot of original dialogue and moments throughout. Now before we get into things that make me nervous, and for those who may be new to the channel, I'm still 100% excited about this show, and will be reserving any judgment until I see the show itself, possibly even until after the entire first season. So take my next comments as nothing more than a major Tolkien nerd thinking out loud and conveying nerves related to something very near to my heart. My biggest concern going in was that this show would follow the Game of Thrones path of violence, sex, and gore. With that concern thankfully and finally put to rest, I'll disclose my second concern. I fear that Galadriel will become a run-of-the-mill action heroine, or as I like to call her, Galadriel Warrior Princess. One of the prominent images in this story even has a cool guys don't look at explosions action hero vibe. One of my favorite things about the Peter Jackson films is the fact that Galadriel is so powerful that she doesn't need armor, or even weapons for that matter, to walk into battle. The way she just casually walks into Dol Guldur and dispenses with an orc with a flick of the wrist is one of my absolute favorite Galadriel moments. She's all the more terrifying because she doesn't need a sword to do damage. And I can already hear some thinking, but she had a ring of power in The Hobbit. You should know that the rings of the elves are devices of defense, not a means of attack. Now, just because she's pictured with armor and a sword doesn't mean we'll lose her magical side, and I definitely hope that we don't. Gladriel is also described as being as angry and brash as she is clever, 
and certain that evil is looming closer than anyone realizes. While the point is made that Galadriel is thousands of years younger than we see her in Peter Jackson's films, the point remains that Galadriel is still thousands of years old at this time. She's over 8,300 years old in The Lord of the Rings, meaning she's approaching the big 5000 at this time. So I really hope she doesn't come off as some impulsive teenager. If anyone would fit that role, it could be Elrond, who's around his 70s at the start of the Second Age. But given the time frame of the Rings of Power, even Elrond would most likely be at least 2,000 or 3,000 years old. So even he wouldn't be a young pup anymore. And that brings me to my second concern about my favorite characters. Elrond being described as a politically ambitious young elven leader. This could mean a variety of things, but full disclosure, just the thought of Elrond being described foremost as a politician gives me a bit of a gag reflex. Now our Farazon, that would be a character that screams politician. Though younger than some of his peers, Elrond is Elven Lord Gil-galad's vice regent and leads the elven armies in aiding Oregion when Sauron attacks. And Gil-galad himself is, in Tolkien's text, the one who perceives the rise of a new darkness and seeks to warn people about it. At my most pessimistic, I fear that the show has taken two of the biggest things we know of Gil-galad and Elrond, wisely perceiving the rise of Sauron and leading the armies of Linden respectively, and simply given them to Galadriel. I hope this isn't the case and we get great heroic adaptations of Galadriel, Elrond, Gil-galad, and the multitude of rich Tolkien characters from the Second Age. They certainly all deserve it, and one shouldn't come at the detriment of the others. When it comes to created characters or characters with increased roles, I think we can look to Tauriel from The Hobbit as both a good example and a cautionary tale. I firmly maintain that Tauriel is a great created character, but for one glaring problem, the love triangle. Take out the love triangle and you've got a great character whose status among the elves is complex. She's totally believable as a great elven warrior, but isn't one note as she is a sylvan elf and therefore seen as lesser than the Sindar, like Thranduil and Legolas. She stands toe to toe with the already established character of Legolas without the films feeling the need to knock Legolas down to show how awesome Tauriel is. Aside from the studio mandated love triangle, Tauriel works. Here's hoping the created characters and beefed up roles in Rings of Power work. As for the other couple images we got, there's one of the previously mentioned Halbrand. It seems that perhaps he's a blacksmith based on the tools on the bench. If I had to guess, he might be in Harad based on the architecture, but it's really hard to say. As for this image of Tir Harad, I get more from the characters than the scenery. This doesn't really scream the southern lands of Harad to me, but it's only a glimpse of one village. I really hope we get some diversity of locales in this show, and it doesn't just come off as Woodland Village number four that could be from any given fantasy show. Finally, we have an image of premier director J.A. Bayona with two nomadic hunters wandering the fields of Middle-earth. I don't have much speculation in terms of what we may be seeing here. For all we know, these could just be extras that feature in a single shot of the show. I'm certainly curious why they wear giant antlers on their backs and what purpose they may serve. I was also very pleased to hear that hobbits won't be a major presence in the show. I was a little worried that the showrunners might feel like a Middle-earth adaptation requires the presence of hobbits to be unlikely heroes, but they're unlikely for a reason. And it seems the creators understand that and won't diminish their impact in the beloved Third Age tales by over-including them here. Again, and I can't say this enough, this is all based on descriptions and a few images from one article. But what Amazon chooses to put in front of us, like the show itself, matters. And it's what we're gonna base our feelings regarding the show on until we have the actual show itself. I'm still 100% excited about this show. I relish in the fact that we'll be returning to Middle-earth. That I'll soon be able to see my beloved Elrond and Galadriel on screen again. That we'll see Khazad-dûm in its glory days that we'll see Gil-galad and Celebrimbor, that we'll see the greatest realm ever to exist fall into ruin. That being said, the fact that such a high percentage of what is described and shown in this article are events and characters original to the show does give me a bit of apprehension. This could just be the particular breadcrumbs that Amazon wants to show us right now. 
knowing the main course is yet to come. At the end of the day, we're Tolkien fans. And fan, after all, is short for fanatic. And you'd be hard pressed to find a fandom that is more fanatic about looking at the hidden details and references and significance in anything and everything put in front of us. Tolkien taught us to look for significance and to expect excellence. I hope this is the greatest show in history. Seasons of TV that truly feel like films, where we sit in awe each and every week as we soak it in. The budget is there, the source material is there, and I, for one, refuse to temper my expectations. My hopes are sky high, because I firmly believe Tolkien's world deserves that. If you want to dive deeper into Tolkien's world and keep up on all the happenings with Rings of Power, you're in the right place. So make sure you hit subscribe and the bell so you never miss a video here on Nerd of the Rings. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Mandu Pandu, Andrew Carlisle, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.